get a misunderstanding. And we're going together. I'll tell them what happened. Cassian Andor is a cold-blooded killer. And frankly, that alone makes him one of Star Wars' most adult and complex characters. I'd rather die trying to take them down than die giving them what they want. Both Rogue One and now Andor stand out in the franchise because they focus on individuals just trying to get by under the jackboot of the Empire. Now that Cassian and a not-so-merry band of rebels are fighting back on Disney+, Plus, it seems like the perfect time to examine how Cassian Andor, a cold-blooded killer, finally resurrected some of Star Wars' forgotten lore. Before we get into it, I've gotta warn you, there's spoilers for Andor Season 1 ahead. First of all, I think it's unfortunate that Star Wars doesn't have a lot more live-action characters like Cassian. You'd think that the grimy, used future in a galaxy far, far away that's in a perpetual state of war would create more of those characters. Flawed individuals, commoners, in every sense of the word, not a bounty hunter or a member of an ancient creed, just regular planet-level people ready and willing to hold a child at gunpoint, all to resist Imperial rule. The time has come to force their hand. People will suffer. That's the plan. The original Star Wars had one character like that, a Carillion born smuggler, devoid of both noble birth and force sensitivity, who didn't fit into the traditional Joseph Campbell hero with the Thousand Faces model. Han Solo stood out not only because he was willing to shoot first, which we're gonna touch on later, but also because at least in the beginning, he was no altruist and had no stake in the rebellion's success outside of monetary no reward is worth this. And while it may have been Luke's journey, it was Han Solo that made Star Wars cool. Not a bad bit of rescue, huh? You know, sometimes I amaze even myself. And this is not me saying Cassian is as cool as Han just because he kills people. It's that Cassian is something the franchise has sorely missed since the original trilogy. An honest to God, live action anti-hero. And a big reason for that? Between Rogue One and Andor, he's two for two in killing someone in his first appearance. Go! Troopers down, section nine. Cassian's introduction in Rogue One features him meeting up with a rebel spy who tells him that an Imperial cargo pilot has defected to the Rebellion with information about the Empire's new super weapon that uses kyber crystals from Jetta. Kind of weapon? A planet killer! Within seconds of Andor being asked for ID, he kills two stormtroopers, then, with reinforcements on their way and a rebel spy with a broken arm, Cassian, with the calm demeanor of a professional who's been in similar situations before, realizes the only way out is up and he'll have to take care of some loose ends before he can escape. He then calms his ally before putting a blaster bolt into his back. Cassian made a decision an admittedly hard one, but one that would protect the Rebellion and its newfound intelligence. Imagine if the Empire took Tivik into custody. Do you think that this name revealed in the credits character would have kept his mouth shut about Bodhi Rook? Sure, he might have, but he also might not have, especially if he had an ISB agent like Deidre Miro interrogating him. The very worst thing you can do right now is bore me. Back to Cassian on Morlana 1, where Andor's opening scene finds Cassian in a brothel being heckled by a couple of off-duty Corpo Renacops on a power trip while he's following up a lead on his lost sister. This is something amusing. Oh, that is a hard look for a little thing like you. After the lead on his sister fizzles out, the sentries follow Cassian into a dark alley to shake him down when things don't go according to their plan. In the process of defending himself, Cassian disarms one guard and accidentally kills the other. What's great about this scene is how Diego Luna clearly portrays a younger, more inexperienced Cassian. In Rogue One, he doesn't hesitate before pulling the trigger. But here, as Cassian listens to this corpo cop plead for his life and pitch an alibi, he fell. We had a misunderstanding. Luna's performance conveys Cassian's surprise with a pensive look as he desperately runs through the mental calculus needed to figure out the sobering reality. Only one of them can walk away free. Andor clearly has the skills of a cold, calculating killer. But so far in Andor, he's still a rogue who only fights for himself. 
That is slowly changing thanks to the influence of rebels like Luthen Ryle and Karis Nemec who are willing to risk everything for the cause. Before the Aldani heist, he killed for survival. When he kills Skeen just for pitching a double cross, 40 million apiece. Don't tell me you haven't thought about it. It's for the cause, even if he doesn't accept it yet. That may not be traditional hero behavior, but it definitely makes him a more dynamic and conflicted character, which is something Star Wars hasn't seen in a long time. Long time. From the minute Cassian kills those corpos, we know he prizes his personal freedom and will kill to keep it. Not unlike a certain charismatic smuggler with a bounty on his head. Cassian's introduction in Rogue One and his reintroduction in Andor feel familiar because it mirrors the first time we meet Han Solo. And it almost feels like this is Star Wars' attempt to atone for one of the franchise's biggest and most avoidable errors. The Han shot first revision. Bet you have. If you've made it this far into the video, I'm going to assume that you know about the Han shot first movement. For those who don't, it all started back in 1997 after an edit George Lucas made in the special edition of A New Hope. In the cantina scene, Han is confronted by Greedo, a bounty hunter looking to capitalize on the price on Han's head. Tell Jabba that I've got his money. Greedo insinuates that bringing in Han cold isn't off the table, but under the table, Han is making his move. In the 1977 theatrical release, Han just aces Greedo unprovoked. I bet you have. In the now canon special edition, Greedo fires the first shot, making Han's lethal bolt a reaction in self-defense instead of a preemptive strike. George Lucas addressed the edit in a 2015 interview with the Washington Post saying, Han Solo was going to marry Leia. And you look back and you say, should he be a cold-blooded killer? Because I was thinking mythologically, should he be a cowboy? Should he be John Wayne? And I said, yeah, he should be John Wayne. And when you're John Wayne, you don't shoot people first. You let them have the first shot. It's a mythological reality that we hope our society pays attention to. Lucas's quote really does a narrative disservice to Han and his growth as a character throughout the original trilogy. What was great about Han and why he was such a standout character is that he wasn't born a hero. He was just a smuggler who was looking for some easy money. Look, I ain't in this for your revolution, man. I'm not in it for you, princess. I expect to be well paid. I'm in it for the money. What made Han such a great character in A New Hope was that he was stuck in the middle. And his arc from a selfish smuggler who has no qualms about killing in cold blood to a rebellion icon is arguably the most compelling in the film and leads to A New Hope's biggest payoff. The film's jump up and fist pump moment isn't when Luke uses the force to aim those fatal plasma torpedoes, it's when Vader has Luke dead to rights but is foiled by Han's face turn. What? You're all clear kid, now let's blow this thing and go home. Losing the Han shot first moment ultimately cheapens Han's trench run change of character because it lessens the distance of his character arc. But here's the thing, the range of a character's morality exists solely within their arc. The wider a character's arc is, the more room there is for morally ambiguous decisions and unpredictable action. And that's what makes characters like Han and Cassian so compelling, because they could be capable of doing literally anything, both good and bad. And every time I walked away from something I wanted to forget, I told myself it was for a cause that I believed in. Neither Han nor Cassian are heroes in the traditional sense. They are willing to do objectively bad things for subjectively good reasons. And that moral gray area hasn't been one really explored much in Star Wars. That's not to say the franchise hasn't tried. There's Saw Gerrera and there's DJ from The Last Jedi. At least you're stealing from the bad guys and helping the good. Good guys, bad guys, made up words. Even a large part of Luke's arc in The Last Jedi was realigning him into a more morally gray area, where he questioned the tenets of the Jedi and almost murdered his own nephew. I failed you, Ben. I'm sorry. I'm not personally a fan of realigning the moral values of decades old characters. Star Wars didn't need to use Luke to have the franchise tread into morally questionable areas. He's the unambiguously good classic hero and that shouldn't change. A 
I'll never turn to the dark side. Still, that doesn't mean that there's not room in that galaxy far, far away to engage with characters making morally difficult decisions. The older I get, the more I want to see Star Wars stories that have less to do with Jedis and more to do with the common people who aren't force sensitive and are stuck under Imperial rule and fed up with it. And that brings us back to where we started in the first place, Star Wars Forgotten Allure. Call it what you will. Let's call it war. War is literally in the title of the franchise, and no one is able to successfully fight a war without getting their hands dirty. Historically, Star Wars hasn't been shy about showing the Empire getting its hands dirty. But the Rebellion has been pretty lawful good until now. You mean kill him? This is what revolution looks like. From scene one of this show, it's clear that Cassian has always done what he needed to do to survive. And just like Han, he got started with the Rebellion for the same exact reason. I'm here for the money. You can't live with that? I'm not worth it? I'll walk away and wish you luck. But that's what it is. I don't want to walk in looking over my shoulder. Cassian's arc has never been about how low he's willing to go to achieve his goals. It's always been about his journey to the Rebellion and channeling his skills for a greater good. Tell him he knows everything he needs to know and feels everything he needs to feel. And when the day comes that those two pull together, he will be an unstoppable force for good. And that's what makes him such a perfect agent to introduce us to a Rebellion filled with morally questionable characters for whom the ends always justify the means. Sure, the show still uses characters like Karis Nemec to influence Cassian with the franchise's more traditional idealism. Fresh inspiration, two seemingly random objects, and yet this charts an astral path, this maps the trail of political consciousness, both systems based on truth, both navigating toward clear and achievable outcomes, basic facts expanding Blame. But the writers also use Karis's naive altruism to serve a greater narrative function. To highlight the ethical line that divides the show's heroes from its villains is much more muddied and that an unambiguously honorable path most likely won't be a successful one. Before Andor, ethically complex decisions were almost the exclusive domain of self-serving rogues like Andor or Han or extremists like Saw Gerrera. Now, because of the vice-like grip of the Empire's ISB, our heroes are being pushed to their moral and ethical limits like no other live-action Star Wars entry before it. After the Aldani heist, Val Sartha was tasked with hunting down and killing Cassian because he's a loose end that can link the heist back to Luthen Ryle. And Luthen Ryle has worked for years to install a mole into the ISB an asset he is willing to protect at almost any cost, which is why he's knowingly walking the rebel leader Anto Krieger and his men into an Imperial ambush just to preserve his agent in the Empire's NSA. They'll be slaughtered. It's 50 men. You're worth more than that. You have to warn them. To what end? Ruin everything? What better way to reassure the ISB there's no leak in security than sacrificing Krieger? Let's be honest, that's a cold f***ing move. So cold that even Saw Gerrera, one of the most extremist resistance fighters in the galaxy, was caught off guard. 30 men. Plus Krieger. For the greater good. Luthen may be willing to lead dozens of rebels to their death to give Deidre Miro a false sense of confidence after vanquishing a rebel cell, but it might be Mon Mothma that will be pushed to make the greatest sacrifice. Thanks to the Empire's stricter tax laws, Mon Mothma could be exposed because of some financial transactions she executed to fund the rebellion. The new banking regulations are making life difficult. Difficult or impossible? I don't know. They're staffing up Imperial auditors by the week. We'll have to see where they place them. To hide them from prying Imperial eyes, she has to enlist the help of a seedy Chandrillian banker with some useful treasury connections named Davos Skulden. The problem with Skulden is that he doesn't want to help Mon for money. He already has that. Instead, he wants a very specific favor, an introduction between her daughter and his son. That may sound innocuous, but Mon's daughter is a strong believer in conservative Chandrillian values and could be susceptible to a marriage proposal from Davos' son, which might put Mon Mothma's family literally in bed with Chandrillian gangsters. 
that puts Mon in a difficult position where she might have to sacrifice her own daughter to preserve the rebellion. A drop of discomfort may be the price of doing business. It's cold and calculating decisions like that, which while unsavory, both win wars and keep viewers coming back. Andor showrunner Tony Gilroy has managed to create some of the most complex and sophisticated Star Wars characters ever put to film. Well, not actually film. All these things are shot digitally, but you get the point. We've never seen Star Wars characters this conflicted because we've also never seen the Rebellion this desperate and without the aid of Jedi or the Force. This is point blank the most adult Star Wars story of the Disney era. And it's stories like these that could take the franchise to the next level and reinvigorate the fan base, which is stuck with it despite the unsteady hand of Disney's leadership. Fight the Empire! Andor features a collection of both Imperials and even more impressively Rebels, whose ruthlessness is nearly unrivaled in live action Star Wars entries. Tony Gilroy and co have finally made a Star Wars show that upholds the promise of what prestige TV aspires to be, compelling explorations of morally ambiguous characters. What is my sacrifice? I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you've got some extra time to watch some more Cinefix videos, be sure to check out some of our top 10 lists, like our top 10 heroes or our top 10 practical effects, which, spoiler alert, features Star Wars. And as always, be sure to subscribe to Cinefix.